Okay, so um, actually the text is quite different. I do not know uh, Matthew. Uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, I think maybe one and a half year ago I really didn't even know the name, uh, but of course in the last year or something quite many might have read some posts about uh, Dask and parallel computing and so on. Um, so then we said, okay, let's reach out, and I used the tool. I never would expect it to do something like this. I clicked on LinkedIn, like such a headhunter thing. So I searched him on LinkedIn, and then I stalked him and said, ah, please contact. And then he answered, really, and um, yeah. So he's really here. It's uh, just two weeks ago, or maybe three. Uh, he said, okay, it's really short notice, but I will manage to do it because uh, PyCon is such a great conference, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so welcome, Matthew. Great. Thank you, everyone. Uh, so, my name is Matthew Rocklin, and I work on a project called Dask for a company called Anaconda. So, Anaconda used to be called Continuum. They're a for-profit company inside the open source Python space, uh, particularly in sort of the numeric computing world. So, like my boss, uh, Travis, made NumPy for example. And so uh, they sell enterprise software, they do consulting services and training. Uh, we also write open source software, it's usually funded by, uh, usually very generously funded by grants. Uh, so that's what I work on. I work on a library called Dask for parallel computing. Uh, so I'm gonna talk about parallel computing in Python today. Um, it's sort of a, it's a keynote, it's a longer talk. So I thought I would start just with a demonstration and then we'll sort of go back in time and see how we got to that demonstration. But hopefully that'll get people uh, interested in the topic a little bit earlier, and it's, you know, it's early. So for me, it's like 1 a.m. So uh, I have a problem that I have a lot of CSV files. Is this text visible in the back? Great. So Ooh, we're hoping. So the, the cluster that I'm working on is also sometimes very saturated by the, by the company. And sometimes it goes down. I had a very rough morning. So let's try this again. This doesn't work, we can switch to video, but let's see what happens. Okay, yeah, let's switch. Maybe download the things for the tutorials after the keynote. <laughs> <laughs> or I had at some point in the past, uh, a bunch of CSV data on now uh, Amazon S S3. And so this data is a New York City taxicab data set. It's every ride in the city of New York uh, for year 2015. It's around 20 gigabytes on disk or about 60 gigabytes in RAM. I would like to do pandas operations on it, uh, but pandas can't handle data that doesn't fit in memory. Uh, so I can read a little bit of it, maybe just five rows there. And we can see it has you know, every information about the, every, every ride. So every row is every time someone got into a cab, where they started, where they left, a breakdown of the fare, the tips, how much the taxes were, et cetera. So again, I would like to use pandas on this data, but I can't. This is a common problem with the Python ecosystem. It's very intuitive, it's very computational, but it's only very good at in-memory data. Fortunately, I do happen to have a cluster nearby. That cluster has eight processes and 64 cores. And so I'm going to use not the pandas data frame, but the Dask data frame, which is actually just many pandas data frames on different machines. What we're seeing here on the right is we're seeing Dask load in around 300 blocks of bytes from those 12 CSV files, and then call the normal pandas read CSV function on all of those 300 blocks of bytes. So in memory, as we're talking, uh, there are now hundreds of pandas data frames that are being instantiated on different machines in my cluster. 
So you can see here when we hover over, so every line is the history of one thread in my 64 cores. You can see they're alternating between reading text and then computing and reading text and computing. So uh, what I get back is not a pandas data frame, it's a Dask data frame. But Dask data frames follow a subset of the pandas API. So this is actually maintained by the pandas developers. So we test directly against the pandas API. When pandas releases, Dask data frame also releases. Uh, it looks the same, it does the same keyword arguments, read CSV, it works with Parquet, it does most of the same things that Pandas does. And it looks the same, because again, it is just a bunch of Pandas data frames. So we're getting here a nice interactive feel for Pandas, but running on a cluster. I'm gonna quickly switch and see if this is working now. Still not working. Great. Uh, so we might compute the length of that data frame. This is a very simple computation, and how we do it is by computing the length of all the individual data frames. It's all these very small yellow boxes on the left. And these are taking a very short amount of time. You know, it looks like maybe 40 microseconds. Okay. Then we, after another 300 times, we move all those communications to one machine and then compute the sum. So this is a very simple, very standard sort of MapReduce style algorithm. And that's easy because length is relatively simple. But we can do more complex things. Uh, okay, it's also relatively fast. So this actually is a bit, a bit slow relative to the implementation today, but it happens in sort of interactive time scales. So we're really targeting people sitting at their computers, analyzing data in real time, connecting to a cluster. We can do more complex things. So let's see how well New Yorkers tip. So we're going to remove some bad rows from our data. There are some free rides in New York City. Uh, we're then going to make a new column, the tip fraction. So is it you know, a 10% tip or a 20% tip? Uh, these are sort of normal tips in the United States. Uh, and we'll see actually what, the, what, it, what it characterizes as. Um, uh, and then we can also you know, group by the day of week and the hour of the day. So we'll see how well people tip by the hour of the day. Do they tip better at noon, do they tip better at 5 p.m., et cetera. So all of this is standard pandas syntax. If you're familiar with pandas, everything on the screen should look more or less familiar to you. Maybe this sort of progress bar is a little bit new. But we, we give the exact same experience as pandas, uh, but now in a cluster. And what that did, so this, this pandas code in the upper left, that broke down our computation into thousands of little Python functions, pandas functions, that need to run on all of my hundreds of, of pandas data frames. So we saw all of those run here. And so then the Dask task scheduler, which we'll talk about, then executed all of those functions in parallel. And what we see, is that uh, New Yorkers tip fairly well. So if you're, cab if you're driving a cab in New York City, you might have a 10% fare, and you'll get maybe 25% more from the, from the rider. Um, surprisingly, it's about 38% at 4 a.m. So maybe like when the bars are closing, everyone wants a cab, and they, they really, really are very happy to get home. So this is a little bit of data science. Uh, it looks just like pandas, and now we're operating on larger data sets. So that's the basic demo. I'm gonna switch over to slides. So let's, let's talk about for a moment how we got there, why we wanted to get there, what are some other options we could have taken, and how we sort of made the choices that we made. So that was the exciting demo. Let's move on. Let's see. Nothing's working today. Okay. Ah, here we go. Perfect. Okay. So. That's present day, we're now walking back in time and we're talking about how we got to that, to that state. So Python has a very mature analytics stack. So it has libraries like NumPy and Pandas, which are both very fast. They're usually written in C or Fortran or Cython. They're also both very intuitive. So it's very easy to use. Add also scikit-learn, scikit-image, and a variety of other libraries. However, uh, these libraries have a flaw in that they're mostly restricted to data that fits in memory and they're mostly designed to run on a single core of a CPU. As that gets larger, as our computers get more parallel, uh, this becomes a, a significant challenge. Uh, and so we ask ourselves, how can we parallelize uh, an ecosystem of projects like this? So I'm gonna steal some talks, some slides from Jake Vanderplas's keynote at uh, PyCon this year, the you know, main PyCon, which is not, not as cool as, as PyCon DE, but still, <laughs> You know, it's okay. So Jake describes the, the, the 
scientific Python stack. He's a scientist. He's an astronomer by training. Says, at the core, there's Python, the language. And then right around the core, there's, there's foundational libraries like NumPy or Jupyter that we use to, uh, you know, to, to, to do our computations, to interact with data. And around that core, there's a, there's a next layer of libraries that build on that core. Libraries for plotting, like matplotlib, pandas for tabular computation, scipy. And on that, you then have a bunch of algorithmic specialty uh, libraries. Libraries like scikit-learn for machine learning, NetworkX for graph operations, PyMC3 for probabilistic programming, et cetera. And on top of that, you have all the scientific domains. So again, Jake is a scientist. You might care about time series or something else. But for him, all the scientific domains are sort of the final layer in this stack. And so we ask ourselves, you know, how can we program, how can we parallelize not just one library, you know, we could try to parallelize NumPy, but how can we parallelize an entire software stack? It's actually quite challenging. Uh, all of these libraries have custom algorithms. It's not just MapReduce. It's not just a simple apply this function to many inputs. Uh, they, they're written by very smart people who've done very sophisticated things. And so it's, it's a challenge to, to parallelize these uh, well. And that's more or less my job and the job of a variety of other people. So let's look at how we might try to parallelize those libraries and some common solutions about parallelism today. And again, you know, my objective is to parallelize everything here, but you may have a different objective. And so this discussion may be of, of general interest, even if you don't care about Dask or you don't care about you know, parallelizing NumPy or scikit-learn or pandas. So let's break down some of the options for programming uh, to a few different classes. Uh, who has used multiprocessing? Right. Almost all the hands. Yeah. So who has used, say, anything in the second row? MapReduce, Flink, Spark, a large parallel SQL database? Many hands, not quite as many. And how about a task scheduler? Airflow, Celery, something like that. Fewer hands. Yeah. So these, these are all relatively different projects, or different classes of projects. And they offer different APIs. And they also offer different performance guarantees. Uh, so let's talk about them briefly. So uh, in the common case, you have map. So I might have, I want, might want to apply a function onto a list of data. And I might want to do that with many cores. I can call the map function. This is the same code semantically. It gives the same result. But it's just written a little bit differently. Uh, and I can, instead, I can call parallel multiprocessing pool dot map. Does the exact same thing Gives me the exact same result, but with different performance characteristics. It runs on different processes. Uh, this is probably the common case. I think probably 90% of parallel programming is with multiprocessing. Uh, you should use multiprocessing if that's all you need. Uh, but sometimes it's, uh, it's not sufficient. Sometimes you want to scale out larger. Sometimes you want to do things that are more complex than just map. So another common set of parallel programming solutions are all called big data collections or maybe high-level collections. These give you some paradigm, some set of operations. Like in Spark, they might give you map, group by, join, filter. And using these operations, you redefine your program. And as long as you stay within that set, uh, Spark will handle all the parallelism for you. It will scale up very nicely onto a cluster, et cetera. There are many other uh, domains like Spark, maybe linear algebra. You have matrix multiply, transpose, reductions, et cetera. So it's a different algebra, but it still does the same thing. If you stay within that set of operations, it will handle all of the parallelism for you. Same with the SQL language. So this is maybe the high-level approach. If you can stay within one of these uh, paradigms, then your problem is already solved by a well-maintained well system. Uh, the third class I'm talking about is task schedulers. And I'm, I'm biased towards this approach. I like this approach more. It's a little bit more low-level. So in a, in a task scheduler approach, you uh, describe many single Python functions that have to run and the dependencies between them. So here we might want to call the function f twice. Maybe this is loading data from two different days. That produces two outputs, x and y. And then we want to call the function g on both x and y. Now f and g are just normal Python functions. I've written them. Maybe they're in pandas, et cetera. These are not big data functions. Uh, but still, there's some parallelism in this graph. I can call both of the Fs twice if I happen to have two different computers or two different cores. Uh, once I've called them, I can then call G and I can call H. So this is maybe a more low level, a more sort of ground up approach to parallelism. 
uh, but it's maybe a bit more flexible. Uh, so here's another task graph. This is actually a graph to compute a parallel singular value decomposition, an SVD. Uh, with a, if you break up your array into five different chunks, you can call a sequence of QR decompositions and other SVD algorithms to compute this SVD in parallel. So this is the kind of algorithm that you can write if you have a task scheduler. It's a little bit more fine-grained. It's a little bit uh, lower level, uh, but you can be much more sophisticated. Okay, so those are a few options. And again, within each class here, there are many different libraries. So Airflow, Luigi, Celery, Make Files, et cetera, all give you task scheduling. Uh, you know, a variety of SQL databases that are all competing for your business. A variety of big data things that are all competing for your business. And there's a variety of linear algebra libraries that are all competing for your business. So, but given the specific task of parallelizing all these libraries, how do each of these classes hold up? Are they good, are they bad? How are they good and how are they bad? So multiprocessing uh, has a couple of very nice virtues. Uh, first, it's very easy to install. It's very lightweight. It's standard in the Python, li in the Python language. And so it's very easy to convince uh, all of the core maintainers of all of these projects to, to depend on multiprocessing. So I talked to many of these people, and they're very, very conservative about what they require. If they require Python 3, they lose all the Python 2 people. If they require C or C++, they lose all of the PyPy people, et cetera. So they're very conservative. Second, multiprocessing is very familiar. Everyone's hand went up when I said multiprocessing. So everyone already knows how to use it. Uh, there's some challenges. It doesn't scale. Uh, it can't handle more complex algorithms. So we, there's no way to write down this algorithm with multiprocessing. It's very, very hard. It's, it's not just a single application of functions. OK. Uh, the big data frameworks. So these add much more capability than just map. Map, group by, join, et cetera. With these operations, you can build a parallel database. You can solve many data science problems. Uh, they scale very nicely, usually. And they're mature and well-trusted. So no one gets fired for installing Spark on their, on their company. Uh, there's some challenges. They're a bit heavyweight. It would be more or less impossible to convince pandas to depend on Spark. Um, they're very JVM focused. This causes some performance problems uh, and also some usability problems. Just simple things like debugging, which is a Python experience is not usually uh, preferred. Uh, everyone that I know who uses Spark, who's a very good developer, eventually transitions to Scala. It's, it's very rare that they stay within Python. Uh, they also can't handle complex computations. And what I mean by that, I mean graphs that look like the top graph. So Spark is very good at mapping, at shuffling, and aggregations, but they're not very good at some you know, computations that look like this. And this is actually relatively simple. This is, uh, if you want to break up a NumPy array and parallelize it, is this computation. Taking H multiply, taking a transpose, taking the mean, the standard deviation. Uh, these slides, by the way, I've, I've tweeted under the PyCon DE tag. Uh, so if you want to skip ahead, feel free to go and look at them yourself. Okay, the task schedulers uh, I like because they can handle these graphs. Uh, they can handle arbitrarily complex task graphs. Uh, they're also Python native, so these are often built in Python. So they support Python from a sort of first class state. However, all of the current implementations do not really, they're not really optimized for computation. Uh, they have long latencies, you know, sort of the hundreds of milliseconds, which is fine if you're running bash jobs, but very, very bad if you're running very fast pandas functions. Uh, so they're generally not well optimized for computation. So um, we want sort of the scalability of Spark, the flexibility of you know, something like Celery, uh, and the familiarity, familiarity and lightweight nature of multiprocessing, something that requires just the standard library. Uh, so a variety of us have worked on that, and that's what we call Dask. So at its core, so Dask is a library for parallel computing that has effectively parallelized many of the PyData libraries uh, and is working to parallelize more. So at its core, it's a dynamic task scheduler. It's like Airflow or Celery. But on top of that, we've built up algorithms for NumPy, for Pandas, for subsets of Scikit-Learn, and for other projects. Uh, it scales well. It scales out to thousands of nodes. It also works very well on your laptop. You can pip install Dask, you can import Dask, and run it just on a thread pool on your local process. So it's very easy to start. It also grows nicely. But you can think of it just like Airflow or Celery, except that it is optimized not for ETL workloads, but for computational workloads. 
Okay, so let's talk uh, briefly about task graphs again. So again, I have some code here at the bottom. We're calling F, we're calling F again, we're calling G on both of those inputs, and we're calling H on one of the inputs. Now, if I write these in Python, it will just sequentially go through each line of code and execute them in, in sequence. Uh, but if we write that out as a task graph, we can see that there's some opportunities for parallelism here. We can call F at the same time. Uh, we then need to track when the F functions are done, when X and Y have been produced, maybe on different computers. And then we want to call G. From different computers, we need, maybe need to move some of that data back to, to one computer so we can call the G function. So a task scheduler takes a graph like this and executes it. And again, these become more complex. This is a singular value decomposition. This is a, a pipeline grid search in, in scikit-learn. So if you, if you have a, a pipeline of machine learning transformations, and each stage in that pipeline has a variety of parameters, you might want to search to find the best set of parameters. And you want to do that in a sort of a, an interesting way where the parameters keep expanding out. And that's this task graph here. And so there's a variety of libraries that build on Dask to produce these task graphs. Then the Dask schedulers execute them. So there's two hard problems here. One is writing down parallel algorithms that can, you know, I can type in grid search and it produces this task graph magically for me. And the second hard problem is executing that task graph on parallel hardware. You know, the hardware might be many cores on a laptop, or it might be uh, the machines in a, in a distant cluster, like what we saw before. So this is showing, I think, four threads in a, my local machine walking through this task graph over time. And you see it's wor walk, working sort of vertically up towards the top. Everything that's red is either in memory or is running in a thread, uh, and everything that's blue has been released from memory. So uh, again, there's two parts here. There's creating the graph, and there's executing the graph. And Dask will help you with both, both, both things. Okay, so let's see a quick example. This is on my local machine, so there's no need for uh, internet connection. Okay, so I have some functions here. They're not very sophisticated. They increment a number, they add one, they decrement a number, they subtract one, or they add two numbers together. But they also sleep for a bit of time to simulate actual work. So please, you know, in your brain, fill in these functions with the functions that you use. Maybe reading parquet files, maybe calling scikit-learn fit, et cetera. So I can run these sequentially in Python, and they'll take you know, a couple of seconds. Uh, or I can use a library called Dask Delayed, which is a way to help us construct task graphs. So I'm going to annotate all of my functions, increment, decrement, and add, with Dask Delayed. And this replaces those functions with instead uh, a lazy version of them. So now when I run this same exact code, it finishes very quickly. And what I get back is not a result, but it's this, this lazy token, this promise to compute the, the work in the future. If I go ahead and look at that thing, so that object Z holds all of the computations necessary in order to produce it. So if I look at Z, it's showing me the graph that it was, it was asked to produce. Call increment, call decrement, that produces two output objects. Then, once those are both done, call add on the results. If I want to now, I can compute that. That will run in hopefully less time, because it can run the increment and decrement in parallel. Okay, this is just using a local thread pool. I'm now using Dask. I didn't start up any cluster, I just imported Dask, and I started writing down parallel algorithms and going. My parallel algorithms looked suspiciously like my single-threaded algorithms. Uh, and products like Dask Delayed help you write sort of normal for loop style code and still end up producing parallel algorithms for you. Uh, but I can also uh, create a cluster. Usually I would do this on you know, my, my company's cluster or on you know, Google Cloud or something. Uh, but instead, I'm going to make it just locally here. So on one computer, I'm going to start a scheduler. This is how you start Dask on a cluster. I'm going to do it here on my laptop just so you can see. So on one computer, I create the scheduler process. This is the central uh, main process. On other computers, I create the Dask worker process and give it the location of the scheduler. And as we see that as the worker starts up, the scheduler uh, hears about it. So they're all sort of connecting to each other now. And that gives me this nice dashboard. 
So now from my local machine, I can now uh, connect to that cluster as well. I see that I have two workers. Each worker has four cores. I've got you know, some gigabytes of RAM. And now when I compute that same object Z, so remember Z is this thing that uh, that holds this computation. My compute Z is now gonna run not in my local process, but on those worker processes I just started. And so we see we called increment, it took 66 milliseconds. At the same time, we called decrement, it took 73 milliseconds, or 730 milliseconds. We then had to transfer the, the result of the decrement call to the other process, uh, it took seven milliseconds, then we called add. So Dask is handling, figuring out where to run computations, it's handling data transfer, and we just write down our algorithms with four loops. So let's do something a little bit larger. Uh, here we're gonna do this you know, in a, with a for loop with larger computations. There it's going and running, and I'm using all of my cores while really just writing normal code. Uh, it's gonna take a little bit of time, so let's go ahead and start up some more workers. And I really should have switched away from master because there's uh, some bugs, as you can see. Yeah, this is really live, live coding. <laughs> okay, uh, I can kill those. Those workers had some problems, uh, and you see the computation restarts. So I'm going to need this later. So we're going to restart everything here. Okay, much nicer. Okay, so you can see that Dask, uh, when you're not on a branch that's trying to fix work stealing at the moment, works just fine. Um, so what's nice here is that we can now create more complex algorithms. So let's say, for example, that we want, to, we have all these numbers on all of our different computers now. We wanna add them up. But we don't wanna add them up by moving them to one computer and calling some. We wanna add them up pairwise. So take every pair of numbers and add those. And take all of those pairs and add those, all of those pairs and add those in sort of a tree. This is a common algorithm you want to do. Um, and so we can write that algorithm ourselves with normal looking Python code. Okay. So this isn't trivial, but if you look at this for a minute, you should be able to see sort of how it works. It does not require a great amount of Python knowledge to write down this algorithm. Uh, and you know, we're, now, we're now creating that graph, we're visualizing it. Uh, visualizing actually takes some time. I was using GraphViz, and you probably can't see that that well. But if you sort of scroll around here, yeah, that's just not visible on the screen. Uh, but we can go ahead and compute that. And Dask can go ahead and compute that for us. So all the little red pieces you're seeing on the dashboard, those are communications. You can almost see the, the tree structure come out. At the beginning of the computation, there's lots of parallelism, there's lots of work to do. As you go towards the end, there's only a very few computations to do. So here we've built our own custom algorithm using normal Python code, uh, even though it was very sort of a complex algorithm. Okay, so on top of projects like that, we've now built other libraries, other higher level libraries uh, that mimic things like NumPy or Pandas or Scikit-Learn so that you don't have to write those for loops. So Projects like Dask Delayed give us the ability to parallelize many other projects in the, the numeric Python ecosystem. So we've coupled Dask with NumPy to create Dask Array, a scalable multi-dimensional array. We've coupled Dask with normal Python lists to make sort of like a Spark RDD kind of thing. Uh, there's Dask with Pandas to make Dask Data Frame. There's a concurrent futures uh, interface, and there's others. Uh, in fact, many companies that use Dask don't use the big data frames they actually want to use Dask to parallelize their own workloads. 
They build their own systems inside their company that are specific to what they do. So um, many people, when they think of Dask, they think of big data frames. But many people who actually use Dask in, in production use the lower level pieces, the task scheduler pieces. It's very flexible to wrap around your own problem. Okay, so uh, there's Dask array. So one Dask array is a large multidimensional array that is composed of many small NumPy arrays. So you might have one NumPy array on one computer, another one on another computer, and Dask array is going to figure out how they relate to each other. Every time you do operations on that array, it will uh, figure out how to arrange all the NumPy arrays together. It follows more or less the exact same API as NumPy. One difference is that you often need to specify how you break down your, your larger array into smaller ones. Similarly, Dask data frame is many pandas data frames that are arranged into a, one large logical data frame. So you might have, for example, all the data for January on one computer, all the data for February on another. And when you do things like resampling or date time operations, Dask data frame will know which pandas data frames to go and access for your computation. Again, it has the same API as pandas. So here is, for example, uh, a NumPy array of 15 ones. And we can compute that same array with Dask and breaking up into chunks of size five. So we have three NumPy array ones functions that create three NumPy arrays. If we do something like compute the sum of that array, we execute that by computing the sum of each small NumPy array and then summing those sums. Again, a pretty typical small MapReduce operation. We switch to multiple dimensions. Now we have a 15 by 15 array cut into five by five blocks. We want to sum across one axis. So now we have three output arrays as our, as our output. It becomes more interesting when you start thinking about operations like transpose. So something like this MapReduce or Spark can do. Something like this is harder. Uh, this is go, sort of goes outside of the normal, um, normal set of operations that most big data tools do. This is sort of where Dask starts to differ from most other tools. Here we take x, we flip it around, we add it to itself. So you see the on-diagonal elements add to themselves, the off-diagonal ones add to their sort of off-diagonal partners. We add the matrix multiply, subtract the mean, take the standard deviation, uh, and we get these more complex graphs. And again, when we compute this, uh, this runs you know, in a few, few hundred milliseconds. So um, again, we build graphs, and then we execute them. So projects like Dask Array build graphs, and then projects like the Dask Schedulers execute those graphs. So there's two different things that Dask is doing for you. Okay, uh, this is where we normally show the example with Dask data frames. So this is where we started the day. So now we can go over here and we can see how Dask data frame allows you to, to parallelize NumPy or Pandas workloads or NumPy workloads across a cluster. Okay. So using the technology we just talked about. So, um, so I usually, I give talks about Dask relatively frequently, and in order to keep things interesting, I try to give a different theme every time. I give sort of the generic talk I just gave, and I try to give something else. So this conference, I wanted to show you ongoing projects. These are things that are not ready, to, or they're ready to use for early adopters, but things people are doing with Dask today. And this might be useful both to give you sort of a good scope of the kinds of things you can do with Dask, and also maybe to encourage you to, to collaborate with some of these projects. There's a lot of low-hanging fruit. It's very, uh, these are very active things to work on. So if people want to, to play, to collaborate, these are good things to, to work on. But I want to make it clear that you should not use these within your company right now. These are not stable. We reserve the right to change APIs, et cetera. So general disclaimer. Everything I'm about to say is very dangerous. Don't, uh, don't blame me. Okay, so there are many Dask interfaces on top of the task scheduler, uh, things like NumPy and Pandas, which are quite mature. They're in production running things right now. I'm sure they're doing terrible things to the stock market. Um, there's also a lot of new work. So today we'll talk about three things. We'll talk about geospatial analysis. We'll talk about machine learning, and that's actually like a few different approaches. And then we'll talk about real-time systems. Okay, so. Uh, these will all be relatively short, maybe like lightning talk style talks. If it doesn't make sense to you, that's okay. Just wait a few minutes and I'll be on to something else. 
So uh, I want to talk about GeoPandas briefly. Has anyone here used GeoPandas? A few people. Anyone here heard of GeoPandas? Okay. How about like post GIS? Okay. Yeah. So more people. So geospatial algorithms. So I'm from New York. Uh, I'm, I live currently in New York, rather. And uh, in New York and many cities today, they're producing a lot of open data. So in the city of Chicago, for example, famous for its crime, uh, you can get every crime that's occurred since the year 2000 and where exactly it has occurred and the officer involved in the kind of crime, et cetera. In New Orleans, a city that's famous for police brutality, uh, you can now get uh, every incident where a policeman used force on a, on a citizen. You can also see the age, race, gender of the police officer and of the, uh, kind of the victim, of the arrestee. You can see the kind of force used, et cetera. So there's a lot of data coming on now that is geospatial in nature. And a lot of it is related to the societies in which we live. So uh, GeoPandas is very use useful for handling geospatial data, data that has lines or points or polygons, uh, like this map of New York. So this is Manhattan, where all the big buildings are. And this is the rest of New York. Uh, I, live, I live over here in Brooklyn. Um, and if you can see, there's actually little small lines here, and it's breaking up New York into many small neighborhoods. Okay. And this is doable very easily with GeoPandas, which can handle these polygons in a very native way. So GeoPandas mixes uh, pandas with uh, geospatial libraries, the same ones that are powering libraries like Postgres or PostGIS. Uh, and then you can do operations on them. Uh, so here we're just showing all the neighborhoods. Here we are counting how many rides originated from each neighborhood. This is actually a, a complex algorithm to implement. Spatial joins are, are challenging. And you can see that, you know, unsurprisingly, Manhattan has many more rides. Uh, there's also an airport here, where it's a bit brighter, and an airport here. This is JFK and LaGuardia. Uh, so you can see some, some interesting spatial analysis. Uh, the problem here is that GeoPandas is, is terribly, terribly slow. Uh, so if you compare it with both GIS on a spatial join, it's something like 10 times slower. On more simple operations, it's like 100 times slower. And that's because uh, GeoPandas wraps uh, shapely objects. I'm getting... I updated these slides, and I want to see if I can get the image back. Maybe, maybe not. Okay, so uh, with GeoPandas developers, not using Dask, we just used Cython. And so instead of GeoPandas wrapping Python objects, wrapping C++ objects, we're now just going straight from Pandas to Cython. C++, and we get the same speed as PostGIS. So there's now a GeoPandas fork that you can use that's running at full C speeds. Uh, that's actually not using Dask at all. This is just of other interest. Separately, we've started using GeoPandas with Dask. So just how Dask array is sort of a grid of NumPy arrays, and Oops, let's see what's going on here. Okay. This is, again, the internet, I think. Yes. <laughs> uh, yeah, so, okay. Um, yeah, we're going offline today. Um, so just as Dask Array is a bunch of NumPy arrays and Dask Data Frame is a bunch of Pandas Data Frames aligned in an index, Dask GeoPandas is a bunch of GeoPandas Data Frames, but now in a spatial index. So you might imagine having all of your data for each country on a different computer. And Dask GeoPandas is now tracking all of those countries. And if you ask for you know, the border, you know, maybe where we are, it might give you, you know, the GeoPandas Data Frame from France and from Germany, and it will help you join those data frames together in parallel. Uh, this is very early, uh, so the Cython work is more or less done. Uh, it needs use from users, though. So if you use GeoPandas, please check out the GeoPandas Cython branch and try it out. Your work may get 10 to 50 times faster. It also will probably break. We'd love to hear about that. Uh, the Dask stuff, uh, so we've implemented all of the very hard algorithms, like spatial joins, just to verify that our approach will work. But we haven't done any of the simple algorithms. Uh, so if you want to contribute, this is a very easy place to make a large impact. Uh, I get you know, 2 to 3x faster using Dask on my laptop, which is quite nice. I also get all the diagnostics and profiling, et cetera. So it's, it's a nice thing to use. Okay, so that was sort of lightning talk number one, geospatial stuff. 
Um, and again, it's, it's very easy to build these relatively complex structures like a spatial index with Dask because it is so flexible. And that's really where Dask is, is more advantageous. Let's look at machine learning. Um, and this will be a little bit challenging because I did want to use the cluster for this. Um, so, when people say machine learning, they actually mean several different kinds of algorithms. And we need to handle those separately. So there are a few ways in which you can use Dask to do machine learning workloads. In general, we try to collaborate with other groups. So we, I don't know machine learning. I know how to compute things efficiently. Uh, and most people on, who work on Dask are of a similar mindset. So we work a lot with the scikit-learn community. We also work with other communities like XGBoost. So we have a few different options. We can try to accelerate scikit-learn directly. So scikit-learn uh, actually already does some parallelism using a library called Joblib. And we can try to parallelize Joblib with Dask and then get scikit-learn for free. That's sort of option one. Option two, we have a really nice distributed NumPy library now. And many machine learning algorithms are built on top of NumPy. And so we can use those exact same NumPy codes, maybe change a little bit, and we can then rebuild scalable algorithms using the NumPy uh, approach. Third, there are other systems that are already distributed, things like XGBoost or TensorFlow, which are already very sophisticated and do what they do very well. I have no desire to compete with these projects, uh, but uh, we can uh, support them. So who here has used XGBoost? Okay. So XGBoost is like very, very commonly used. Um, I think you know, the data robot guys who test many different algorithms say it's almost always the best choice. Uh, who, so people who have used XGBoost, keep your hands raised. Who has used distributed XGBoost? There's a guy back there. Raise your hand higher. <laughs> There's a woman. I'm sorry. I, I totally apologize. <laughs> I feel really yeah, uh, normative now. I apologize. Um, yeah, there's one person in the back who's used distributed XGBoost, but it exists. XGBoost is a distributed framework. It can do its own thing. Uh, it's just hard to set up. Uh, so Dask can do things like set it up inside the same Dask processes. Um, and so we can run many Dask workers, and inside those exact same workers, we can also run XGBoost. And we can pass data from Dask data frames back and forth and manage all of that uh, administrative work while we're letting products like XGBoost or TensorFlow do all of the hard machine learning work. Okay, so let's talk about, uh, so let's go through each of those options uh, briefly. So uh, with scikit-learn, so often in scikit-learn you create some estimator, maybe here a grid search or a random forest, and then you fit that estimator. And uh, many scikit-learn estimators are actually built with joblib, which is a library that uh, gives you embarrassing, it's like multiprocessing pool, you can also use threads, um, and uh, most scikit-learn algorithms are built on that. So by collaborating with the scikit-learn developers, uh, you can now actually hijack, you can take over Joblib with Dask. And so this allows you to uh, run your grid search or your random forest directly on a cluster without changing any of your machine learning code. So your existing scikit-learn code in many cases can run just fine. Uh, I would normally switch to a cluster and show you this live, uh, but uh, not today. Uh, so uh, this is good for things like model selection, like grid search, uh, and for embarrassingly parallel operations, like random forests. Uh, it's not very good for large data. So scikit-learn is built on NumPy arrays. So it's not going to train large data sets for you. But it's still quite, uh, quite convenient for some common cases. Uh, it works well today. It's in released versions. Uh, but we're also working with the scikit-learn developers to improve it in the future. OK, option two. We can use Dask Array to build parallel algorithms. So this is some code, such as you might find in a convex optimization solver, such as it would be useful in logistic regression, or any algorithm like logistic regression. And this code, you might ask, is this NumPy code or is this Dask Array code? And the correct answer, I'm sure you're saying, is that it's either one. Uh, you can write the same algorithm with either, either library, and it'll work just fine. If you use Dask Array, it will produce this task graph on the right. So you can imagine that you know, producing a, con a parallel convex optimization solver is a challenging task. You have to actually think about things at this detail, but Dask is actually doing that for you. Because Dask Array has already implemented you know, matrix multiply, transpose, all the operations that are here in the upper left. 
And so it's a relatively easy approach. The person who actually built uh, Dask uh, GLM as a project uh, that does all these things really doesn't know much about parallel programming. He just wrote NumPy style code and we helped him change a couple of things. It was a very easy process. So uh, using that, you can import things like logistic regression, which has the exact same API as scikit-learn, but now can operate on distributed task arrays. The regularizers, there are different GLM families. You can combine these all to do a variety of things. Uh, so if you're sort of familiar with this space, hopefully this slide makes sense to you. If not, don't worry about it. Okay, so the good part of this is that you can train large data sets with this style of algorithms. Uh, it's extensible to new methods. It's built decently well, and it supports the scikit-learn API cleanly. So you can drop it into existing pipelines. Everything works nicely. Uh, the bad is not as efficient as scikit-learn on single machines. So when we were building this, actually, we were benchmarking with the scikit-learn developers. And for a little while, uh, we were actually faster. Uh, the Dask implementation was faster than the scikit-learn implementation. You know, using eight cores, we could get a 1.5x performance over scikit-learn. We were very excited. Uh, and then Olivier Grissel, who, who works on these things from scikit-learn, said, ah, but no, we just rebuilt our solver, and now we're six times faster. <laughs> so it's a good lesson that you should not use parallelism unless you need to. So you can often be very efficient on a single machine by thinking harder about your algorithms. And that was, that was a lesson. We were throwing many more cores at the problem, and that was not the right approach. The right approach was to be more intelligent about our algorithms. Uh, this is good to go. This is, works nicely. It works in production. Uh, Chris White, who did most of the work, works at Capital One, uh, a large American financial institution. Uh, it could use benchmarking. So if anyone wants to compare this to H2O or Spark MLlib, uh, that would be very welcome, especially publicly. Uh, I would love to see those numbers out there, uh, especially on real world problems. Uh, the example I was going to show you was on fake randomly produced data. We're just going to see the, the diagnostics page look pretty. Uh, but maybe you have real problems, real data sets, and it'd be wonderful to see these algorithms really benchmarked, show where they fail, try different chunk sizes, et cetera. So that, that's a really good place for uh, collaboration. Okay, uh, the last thing I'll mention is you can deploy other services with Dask. So Dask is... Uh, a Dask cluster, so if you're using Dask on a cluster, you have a single centralized scheduler, you have many workers that are doing all the work, and the scheduler is sort of like a very smart secretary. It's telling all the workers what to do, the scheduler is not doing any work itself. The workers share data between each other, and they do all the work, they hold on to the data. Now, if I want to do something like XGBoost, I might use Dask DataFrame to prepare my data, make training data, make testing data, make the labels, remove some data from my training, from my data set. And then I want to use XGBoost, so I'm going to start XGBoost in all of my Python processes. Then Dask, because it knows the network, can help XGBoost connect to itself. So XGBoost is now creating its own separate distributed cluster using the exact same Python processes I'm using for Dask. And then Dask can hand data over to XGBoost. Uh, so this is two distributed computing systems talking to each other and collaborating within the same process space. So there's no need for serialization. There's no need to copy memory around. They're actually just inside the same processes. And all of this happens under the hood when you change your import from XGBoost to Dask ML XGBoost. And this sets up the whole network for you, runs XGBoost, cleans everything up and tears it down, and gives you back a normal XGBoost result. So again, this is Dask. We're not reinventing these algorithms. We're doing what we can to facilitate their use on clusters. Okay, so this is good. It works with XGBoost. We have a similar thing for TensorFlow. Uh, it handles all the administrative work, but it doesn't handle any of the uh, actual computational work. These libraries are already very good at what they do. We have no desire to compete with them. Uh, the challenge here is that you still need to understand XGBoost, and you still need to understand TensorFlow. So when I say that there is a People, there's a lot of hype about TensorFlow currently. When I say that Dask works with TensorFlow, I'm saying it can set it up and it can hand data to it, but you still need to understand how to use it, which is, it is non-trivial. Uh, so we're not automating anything like that. Um, they're very small projects. They're not heavily used. It'd be good to see more use and more, and more bug reports. Okay, uh, there's a lot of work here. Uh, most of it was not done by myself. Uh, these people have done most of the work here. 
They have blogs. I'm sure they would love to see your participation on their blogs with comments or issues on GitHub. Uh, and especially thanks to Tom Augsburger, who's, who's now sort of collecting all of this work under the Dask ML package. So if you want to learn more, uh, please go to daskml.readthedocs.io. It has more information I haven't just described here, but all the documentation here is represented there. Uh, okay, so let's, uh, I think I'm not going to talk about much about streaming systems, other than to say that they exist. So often you have continuous data sets. So you have data that's coming in all the time, maybe off a of Kafka queue, you have a financial time series, and you want to deal with it. Uh, there was a very good talk about this uh, yesterday uh, by Axel uh, from Billinger. Uh, who talks about uh, their uh, pipeline as they scrape websites for product information. And you see there's various flows through this graph, there's some feedback, they're storing to various data sets, doing a variety of computation. And the question I had is, how can I make this easier to do within Python? And is there some way to use it with Dask? Built a small project, uh, Streams, which uh, does simple things for streaming operations. This was designed to be a simple microproject. I built it in a weekend. Uh, so it's not very serious, but it, people started coming on, they started using it, and it has solidified a little bit more. Uh, it's very small, it's very clean, it uses Tornado for concurrency, and then on top of that recently, I've been building more things. So as sort of a, a fun demonstration, I want to show you the streaming data frames. So I have a data set, and it's a pandas data frame, but it keeps updating. This is just random data being generated. And so you see this is a time series, it's for now, and there's three columns that are changing around. Now, I might want to do some pandas-like operations, like maybe select only certain uh, rows, compute a mean, and again, I'm computing that mean. So with a normal pandas operation, this would give me a single static result as it looked at all of the data I had. But now my data keeps coming, so I want to need to compute uh, updates. Uh, let's do something sort of fun, and let's plot that data. So here I'm plotting both the, the raw data and a 100 millisecond uh, smoothed version of it. So again, this is no Dask. This is just using Tornado and you know, simple computations. Let's make that a little bit more complex. Let's add in a, maybe a very smooth. Maybe we'll also add a variance. So it's interesting both to do streaming operations, but also the visualization is nice. So in the top, I'm using IPython widgets, and then this is a bokeh plot. Okay, so it's a, it's a cute magic trick. Um, let's make even more magic, and let's start up Dask. Do I still have a cluster running? I do. There probably has way too many workers. Let's kill some of these workers. Is that good? I don't need that anymore. Okay. Uh, let's actually just restart the whole cluster. Okay. So we're going to do that same thing, but now we're going to do it with Dask. And I think I need to change here, Dask equals true. Yeah, so all the things we've seen before, there's a single graph and Dask computes that graph. Now we're actually submitting work on the fly. So every time we're producing work, it's not happening locally, it's happening on my worker processes. If I do, you know, ask for more computations, you know, Dask will start doing more work for us. Now, if I start doing again more things, let's rip this. Nope. Ah, I need a... This is actually a little bit slower response because there's more communication happening. 
But now we're getting the same computation, this rolling computation happening with task. So again, you shouldn't necessarily use this. I built this a couple weeks ago. Uh, but it gives you an example of the kind of thing you can build with Dask relatively easily. There's about 1,000 lines of code for the streaming stuff. There's going to be a 500 for pandas, maybe another like 500 for Dask. So it's, it's decently doable. OK, that's enough. Uh, so um, yeah, so we talked about a few things. We talked about uh, parallel programming paradigms, which may be of use to you even if you don't use Dask. Uh, we introduced Dask generally to task scheduler that has NumPy and Pandas APIs on top. And we saw some sort of fun current efforts. So uh, thank you all for your time. I want to briefly thank sponsors, uh, both the wonderful PyCon uh, Deutschland uh, conference and also people who funded Dask. So this is the Moore Foundation, uh, Philanthropic Nonprofit, Anaconda, people who I work for, as well as a variety of government agencies like the National Science Foundation, DARPA, also some other people. So uh, thank you for your time. Hello. Hello. Yeah. OK. Yeah. Thank you very much. Very interesting. So for me, the stream thing is really, really uh, yeah. hot shit. Um, <laughs> I think there are questions. First here. Um, uh, since it's pure Python, so it should work with PyPy. Did it, did it test with PyPy? Does it make it faster? Uh, we have tested with PyPy, and no. 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 <laughs> We're using the scheduler. So the scheduler is pure Python, and it uses a subset of Python that is decently fast already. I, I also work on the PyTools project and the SciTools projects, which are sort of also very fast C Python codes. Um, and it's more or less the same style of computation. So yeah, I've tried. I would love it if it were. Next question here. When placing the workloads, uh, does, uh, does Dask also optimize the data transfer yes. between nodes? Yes. OK. Yeah. No, we've, we work with lots of different groups, have many different computational requirements. And you know, they pay us money to make sure everything runs fast. Uh, and uh, yeah, Dask is very heavily optimized. So most NumPy, Pandas, scikit-learn like computations, anything that looks anything like any of those, we're already optimizing fairly well for them. Uh, thanks for your talk. This is really awesome. Uh, I have one question, um, in particular in compilers, but in databases, uh, one of the challenges is not only specifying the execution graph, but reasoning on that graph in terms of rewriting the graph, right. but also having cost estimates. So mm -hmm. you enumerate zillions of variants using, say, dynamic programming or something like that, and then you execu execute one of those. And that gets more challenging yeah. the more you <clears throat> get into the peril world. So have you thought about how to integrate these kind of things? I mean, uh, the big opportunity here I'm seeing is that you uh, tear down the wall between the boundaries of programming language optimization and database optimization, which, which is fantastic. But have you thought about how to integrate that? Yeah, definitely. So uh, the short answer is we don't do high-level database optimizations. So if you want to do very complex SQL algorithms, Dask is not the right choice. You should use a real database like Postgres or Impala or something. Uh, so usually there's high-level optimizations, like transposing joins and filters. Then it gets translated into a task graph. And there's optimizations there as well, more similar to maybe compiler optimizations. We do a lot there. So we optimize on that task graph very effect effectively. Uh, but we're not a database. And we don't specialize to pandas-style operations. So we don't know really what the high-level database operations are. We think a lot about uh, dynamic real-time um, diagnostics. So we capture the time every task took to run, how many bytes it produced, how much serialization there was. And we make runtime decisions to optimize those. But it's always on generic task execution. It's not on SQL style optimization. So this is bad because we won't be as good at SQL op operations. But this is good because we will be robustly good at everything else. Uh, so if you have some other custom operation, the task optimizations will probably be useful for that as well, just not as useful as a good SQL optimizer. OK, more questions? Over there. Um, so how challenging is it to configure a cluster to run a desk? Because this is kind of one of the barriers sometimes people have to, for example, run Spark um, it would be to configure the cluster. So how does yeah. this work? 
It, um, it depends entirely on what your cluster looks like. So I configured a cluster on my laptop by using a couple of commands. Uh, so that, that was very easy, but usually people aren't running clusters on the laptops. Some small groups maybe have like six machines and they just SSH, and that's easy to do. Uh, more often, you use some sort of job scheduler. You use Mesos, or you use Yarn, or Kubernetes, uh, and people have used Dask with all of those technologies. And if you search for Dask and your cluster manager of choice, there's probably some project like that. Um, but it, it depends very strongly. You, know, you may work at a company that has a very locked down, secure cluster that uses Kerberos authentication, and that's a challenge. But it's as hard as your cluster makes it. Yeah. Uh, just, just a small reminder, you can download now all the stuff for the tutorials, so more questions. You can also download Dask. <laughs> Ah, he, he, ch he, just, he just announced a tutorial happening. <laughs> ah, yeah, perfect. Yeah, I think uh, Catherine's tutorial used Dask a bit. Yeah, so you need to install. More questions? So I have a question. I implemented a very, very tiny algorithm, and for me it was a bit weird because I implemented something like this uh, maybe two years ago for a different paradigm. So it feels like every two years you need to rewrite, re rewrite all your algorithms because there's some kind of new thing, but it feels so similar. So you have a map, you have a reduce, but now just the API is a little bit different or the imports are different. So is there anything inside that there's some convergence? So maybe something like a meta parallel language? No. Very good. More questions. <laughs> that being said, we've tried very hard to uh, adhere to common APIs. So, like, we use NumPy syntax. We use Pandas syntax. We use the concurrent features uh, thing as PEP 44. Uh, so we adhere to a lot of existing standards. It's async await compatible. So with Dask, we tried very hard to not invent any new thing you need to learn. Everything that I showed, I hope, looked familiar. We use for loops, we use function calls, we use NumPy and pandas syntax, we use scikit-learn functions. And so ideally, the APIs haven't changed that much. And again, we work with the pandas developers, the scikit-learn developers, the Jupyter developers to ensure that we're all progressing together. OK. If there are no questions, then let's thank Matthew again. There are also some stickers uh, at the NumFocus booth, if you guys want stickers.